Hi, my name is Sean Olson. In this video, I'm going to teach you how to use displacements in Wallworm. And displacements are a specific type of geometry for landscapes for the source engine. So we're going to work in both Hammer and Max to kind of show you the similarities and differences of working with displacements between the two applications. And then we're going to go into advanced functions and features entirely inside of 3ds Max. So we're going to start the process in Hammer and then go into Max and show you the similarities and differences and compare the two. So first, we always have to start with a brush. So all displacements come from brushes. So I'm going to start with a single brush here. I'm going to zoom my view out so I can see this in the 3D view. And I'm just going to shift drag this a few times so that we can have a few of these in the scene. And I can control click to select multiples, shift drag to make copies of your current selection. And your displacements, the edges of them, should always line up together. So I'm going to move this up here. So I'm just making a few of these so I can make a, basically like a little valley. And I'm going to shift drag these up here in this viewport. And that's good enough for this example. So we're going to have a little valley corridor of displacements that we have along here. So to convert these into displacements, we go to the Texture Application Tool. And we go to the Displacement tab. Click Select. And, oops, excuse me. Click Select and just select on the faces that we want to convert into displacements. Now notice, for these brush sides, you must always choose that are quads, they have four sides to the brush. Otherwise, it cannot be converted into a displacement. That holds true inside of 3ds Max. It's a fundamental limitation of how displacements work in sort. So at the point we have these selected, we just hit this Create. I'm going to choose Power of 3. That's the resolution of these displacements. And you're going to notice that immediately it hides the brushes underneath, which are not actually going to export as brushes in the game. And it makes these displacements and we're going to stop here and now do the same thing inside of max so we're in max here and we're going to do the same thing we just did and i'm going to increase my grid spacing a little bit here so in this case uh, i'll do the same thing we did inside of hammer so i'm going to create boxes and i have grid snapping on so we're just going to create a box here and i'll just do the same thing and we're going to move these, shift drag this up to this point. Now, because in 3ds Max, geometry is not automatically a brush, I need to assign these as brushes. So I go to Level Design and Set Selection as Brush Geometry. Now notice, by default, these objects have no materials. However, in Hammer, they always automatically have a material. Now that's kind of an important thing to understand. Uh, you'll have to either assign materials, which I could have already done that. I could do that right now. Or we can set up functions to automatically assign materials like we do in Hammer. And I'll do that later. But for the moment, I'm actually going to bring up the same material that I used in Hammer. So I have these nine objects selected. I'm going to go to Materials in the VMT browser and browse for the same material, which was under Nature. It's right there. So I'm going to just hit Add Materials to Selection. So those objects will have those material. At this point, what we need to do is select our faces to turn into displacements, just like we had in Hammer. So what I can do is uh, add a poly select modifier and just select the polygons. So I had selected all of these objects and added one modifier, the same modifier uh, on all of them. So I'm poly select here. So now I'm going to open up a new rollout floater. It's under level design and it's called the displacement floater right here. And I'm going to snap, I'm going to dock this over here on the side. And this is important. There are two buttons up here. 
all quad faces are only selected quads. So this will create displacements from the brushes that we have here. And it doesn't require brushes, but it's a good idea that you had made these brushes. If I do all quads, it'll use every single face on all of these, but that's not what I want. I only want the selected. Also, I need to choose the power here. I'm going to choose power 3. And if I want a specific light map scale for these, I can set those here. And at this point, I'm just going to click only selected, fa only selected quads. Once we do this, it's going to create displacements. And when it did this, let me hit F4 here, you can see now that these are uh, triangulated as displacements are. So now we're at the same point between the two applications. So let's go back into Hammer because this is where the workflow is really going to diverge. So creating the displacements is fairly similar. Let's go back into Hammer here. So we're going to do uh, discuss the differences between the Hammer and Max workflow. So in, in Hammer, one of the common tasks at this point might be to subdivide these. So you might select all of these, we'll go to the displacement, and the subdivide function will create a smoother transition for all of these. So let's go ahead and do that, subdivide. So here we have the subdivision between these. And then we might want to paint alpha, so blend between the two. And in this case, we might start painting uh, between A and B, the materials A and B. So we might have down here, it's got some grass along the tops and the path where you walk, and then the walls are rock here. So this gives you an idea here. And then we can go in here and do sculpting. So there are different tools that you have in here for raising and let's maximize this viewport. So we can go ahead and go in here and sculpt our landscape however we want. We might want to raise the back here. Raise the back. Oops. Raise the back here a little bit more where the rocks are, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now notice I had selected all of the displacements at once and then started working with them in here. And that's generally not how you work with it inside of 3ds Max. You can, but there are many reasons not to. So I'm not even going to demonstrate this exact same workflow. What we're going to do is work with a type of object that's inside of 3ds Max called a Sculpt Mesh. So we're going to accomplish the same thing here, but we're going to use a Sculpt Mesh instead. So back inside Max, we have all of these displacements still selected. I'll go ahead and show you a way you could work with all of these at once in a hammer type method, but I'm going to explain why you shouldn't use this approach and you should use the Sculpt Mesh method actually instead. So first I'm going to go and say, okay, we want to do some vertex painting on all of these. So because this is a, a blend material, world vertex transition, which is two materials back and forth, I'm going to use the paint alpha function right here. So if I click this, it, it's going to add, add a modifier on here, and it's going to allow me to paint the alpha on these objects. And... I'm going to do it like this just to make it kind of similar to what we had on the other one. So this is an instance paint alpha. And then I can go and add an edit poly modifier on top of all of these to in order to work on all of these at the same time. So if, for example, I'm going to bring up this thing called the ribbon in the freeform tools here. And it's not showing me the freeform tools. And that's because you can't use these when you have multiple objects selected. So that's one reason this method is not what we want to use because these freeform tools here are what we want to really use for sculpting. But if you want to use, keep these all as separate objects, 
you can go into the edit poly modifier and go to this push pull and I'm going to push and pull in the Z axis here and you know go ahead and push and pull these. Now, you're going to notice here that when I do this, these are getting out of sync. So that's one reason we don't want to use this method. Now we can sew these. So uh, in Hammer, there's a function to automatically sew. And I actually see I have a displacement here I didn't expect to have. We'll deal with that. And so to sew these, I'm going to have to convert these to editable polys. And now add so and it will sew them but we really don't want to use this method so instead I'm actually going to undo all of these changes and go back to where we were so we have all of these objects that are displacements here I'm actually going to select this displacement and delete it because we don't want that one here so now we're back to these displacements being flat again. We still have the vertex paint. That's fine. Instead, we're going to use a sculpt mesh. So the sculpt mesh, what it is going to do is going to create a new object that represents our displacements, but is not the displacement. So right now you see that these different uh, wireframe colors show the different objects selected here. What I can do is deselect everything. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want to create a sculpt mesh of the entire scene. I want every displacement in the scene to be part of this sculpt mesh. I'm going to create this button here that says Create Sculpt Mesh. If I didn't have this floater out, you can also click Wallworm, Level Design, and Create Sculpt Mesh. It will run the same function. And it's going to warn me. It says because there are less than two objects selected, all displacements will be turned into a sculpt mesh. So if you want specific sculpt meshes or specific displacements used in your sculpt mesh, you need to select them specifically. In this case, I want them all. So I'm going to click yes. Now notice that there's only one object selected and it's named over here displacement sculpt mesh 001. Using a sculpt mesh has many, many benefits. And now you see when I had the freeform tab already selected, as soon as this got converted, you see that this is open and available because these are tools that I want to have access to to sculpt my landscape. So these tools are way more convenient than the other functions here. Also notice that as I push and pull, I'm going to... Oh, that's stronger than I wanted. As I push and pull these, let's bring my strength down to 10. It seems to be very strong right now. I don't need to worry about the auto sew. If they were already sewed, if they were already sewn before creating the sculpt mesh, then they will be sewn here. Okay. So the next thing is we'll do the subdividing. So in the previous one, we subdivided this. And inside of Max, you don't call it subdividing. We're just going to add a relax modifier. So if I go to the modifier tab, and in the modifier list here, select relax from the list. I can now modify it across the object with these spinners. So I can in real time kind of see how this relax is happening. So I maybe wanted to have done this before I sculpted, but that's okay. And we have different options. For example, if I don't want these outside ones to be stuck there, I can uncheck this keep bounder points. Or if I wanted them to stay on the outside no matter what without... So we have a lot of control over this. And once we have this, 
we can then continue working with it however we want. We can keep on adding new modifiers on top of this if we want to, or I can convert it to an editable poly. Now notice that once I'm at the relax modifier stage, my freeform tools are gone. So I can go back down the modify stack and click on my editable poly, and now they're there because these tools are only available to editable poly. Now, any change I make here will be sent up the stack to the relax modifier. So if I hit, if I want to see the results of what I'm doing, including the relax modifier, I can click this button here that says show in results. So I can still sculpt at this level, but then see what will happen at the next stage. So here I might uh, use a shift tool bring these up, maybe bring this whole section up, maybe I want to bring this whole section out like this. Now here is something also, because this is the modifier stack in Max, I can actually decide, instead of relaxing the entire object like this, instead I can select just the polygons that are going to be relaxed. To accomplish that, I'm actually going to go back down to the Edit Poly modifier. I'm going to turn off Show and Results so I can easily see which sections of my mesh I want to do this to. And I'm just going to I'm going to select vertices now. And I'm hitting Control control click uh, to, to add to my selection. And I'm just going to do it like this for now. And now we're going to show in results and see that the relax is only happening on the selected vertices. So you can see over here that we see these dots. That signifies that this object is now in vertex sub-object mode. And that's what's being passed up the stack. So the relax modifier is only working on those selected vertices. So if I wanted it to work on more, I can at this level either expand my selection or I can actually say, you know what, I want the selection uh, to use something called soft selection. So if I click on this and I expand the fall off level, you're going to see that it's only go it's going out from that selection but it's at a soft curve so understanding how soft selection works and understanding how sub object selection which currently we're using the vertex sub object level is passed up the stack is important in understanding how you can do fine controls of how the modifiers work and how they interact with each other if i want to change this iterations here now. I can do that and notice that anything that's outside those vertices of the selection are not being affected. So those that are directly in the bottom that are not included in the selection, they're not changing. Same with the tops. And you can see it's still demonstrating the soft selection fall off by the colors of the, the selected edges in this view, but it's driven by the vertices. Now, it's important to understand that the, because I'm in uh, vertex sub-object selection, every new modifier I happen to add to this will only use those vertices. So if I add another uh, modifier on top, let's use noise. So this is another function in Hammer you might use to add noise to the landscape. In this, if I want to uh, do noise just in the x-axis, I can add it just to the X, so this modifier allows it. But again, notice it's only working on the current sub-object selection. The ones outside of the selection are not being used. If I want to change the scale of these, and notice it's all in real time. I can see uh, how these changes are, are affecting the final results. I can keep this stack, I can keep the modifier stack as long as I want, or I can collapse it to an editable poly. Here are the important rules with working with any displacements or sculpt meshes, which again, this is a sculpt mesh. One, never delete any face or vertex. You are not allowed to delete any. 
If you do, you will invalidate the geometry. Two, never add any modifiers that change the number of vertices or faces on the sculpt mesh or displacement. If you do, again, you will destroy the object. So if, for example, I do add a modifier uh, that might take away polygons, for example, delete mesh, this will completely invalidate the geometry. So you cannot do it. If there are modifiers on the sculpt mesh, Wallworm will not know about this and there will be problems. So only if you're at an editable poly level and you start deleting things, Wallworm will know about it. But if you have a, any modifiers on here, it won't know. So it's up to you to understand like, oh, I cannot delete polygons. So don't use a delete mesh modifier. Don't use a Grebo modifier. Uh, don't use anything that changes the number of vertices, the number of faces, or even the order of the faces and vertices inside the mesh. If you do add one of those modifiers, just make sure you select it and hit delete before you try uh, to continue forward with your sculpt mesh. It's very important. So because this again is a uh, is using the modifier stack and we have, we're going up and down it, I can still go back down to the base level. And if I want to, I can see it be for any transformations or after. In fact, you'll see currently uh, the cage and wireframe of this is showing uh, with the vertices, the currently selected vertices and uh, what the results are. Now, because we're using vertex subobject selection and that's what we have selected and go up the stack, if I change the current subobject selection to a polygon, Notice that the mesh actually completely, the end results of this is that not much happens because we don't have any polygons selected. And you see now this square here, this designates that that's the polygon subobject selection that's going up the stack. So in this case, hit Q here, if I add a selection to those polygons, now that's the only thing being affected by those modifiers. If I go back to the vertex subobject selection, we're getting these kind of results. So this is kind of important to understand, especially if you want to uh, work on different levels of this. If you go back down and change the subobject level, it's going to change the results you see here. So one thing that we can do, if we want this vertex subobject selection to start at the relax and go up, but we still want to change, say, polygons or other kind of things down below, what we can do is actually add a polygon select modifier at this point and at that level select that modifier and choose vertex subobject selection. And you can see now that this has those vertices selected and it's going up the stack. Now if I show in results actually we to get the same results we need to turn on soft selection at that modifier and go back up so make it similar to what we had before and now we can go back down to the edit poly modifier and go to other subobject modes and, and change things at this point without changing the subobject selection above because now we've kind of baked in the so selection of the poly select sent it up the stack and now we can go down below it and work in the edit poly modifier and to work with other modes. For example, if I wanted to select the borders of this and uh, move them out. So we can see, you can see here that uh, it looks like the noise modifier might be uh, causing that uh, to zoom in and out there in ways that we don't want. So let's go back and, and see why that's happening. And the reason that's happening is because our noise is using X strength. Probably don't want X strength here. Get rid of that. Right click the spinner to go to zero. And we're just going to spin this up and down. So now it's up and down. So you can see now we can go back and forth and play around with our results however we want 
and, and keep the modify stack intact. This gives you a lot of versatility. There may come a point where you don't really need these anymore. If that ever happens with the sculpt mesh, you're always free to right click, and go to convert to, and choose editable poly. This is important. Let me go up here so we can see the menu a little bit better. Always convert to editable poly. If you convert it to an editable mesh, editable patch, or any other type of geometry, it will invalidate the sculpt mesh. So do not do any kind of conversion except for editable poly. Only choose editable poly. So if I do this, notice that the modifier stack is now back down to just this base object, which is the edible poly, and all of those other levels are gone. Now again, I didn't, I wasn't forced to do that. I could have, or I could have kept it. So it's really your choice as you're doing your designing here. So now we say we maybe want to paint this a little bit more, the alpha. So again, we can just go to the paint alpha button over here, and we might paint it. So the paint alpha uses black to white. So if I click this button here, it, it pops up the color swatch. Basically just go between these two. So if I want it to be fully, fully one material, I go to black. And if I want it to be fully one, the other color, I go to white. If you kind of need a mixture, you can go in the middle. So for gray, it's kind of both. It's a little bit more blended. And you can just do uh, whatever you need to do to make it look however you want it to do to look like. You can also, if you want to, use this blur. This is blur all. So if I click this, it's going to blur the entire thing a little bit, blend it in. You can also use the uh, blur brush. So wherever you paint becomes blended more between the two. Uh, it's already kind of blended, so we're not going to see much difference here see a little bit here so this is kind of important to understand that when it when we're doing the vertex alpha blending all it is is a vertex paint modifier which is named by default when you click the paint alpha button ww vertex paint modifier and you can see that it's choosing the channel vertex alpha now if you paint on any other channel it won't be the channel that exports. So this is the only channel you'll be able to paint on for the two-way blend materials. For the four-way blends, which we'll discuss a little bit later, you use a different channel. So whenever we press this uh, Paint Alpha button, it's really just doing the same thing as had you had it selected and gone down and, and added a Vertex Paint modifier and then chosen Vertex Alpha and gone between the different modes here. Now, if you want to see the Vertex Alpha channel itself without the texture, you just click this button up here in the Vertex Paint and you can see in a black and white representation of the blending here. And if you want to, you can actually paint in this mode. So, uh, if I wanted to have this a little bit dark here and, and painted that, you can see uh, in this mode what's happening but if you want to see the textures you just you click this button here and it will show you the texture blending now this is only going to work if you use specific type of materials inside of 3ds max if you want to see the blending in the viewport i'm not going to cover that uh, on making those in particular but i am going to open up the material editor and explain to you uh, the type of material so i'm going to use this pick material button now this material was brought in with the VMT browser. I'm going to bring that out. This uh, allows you to bring in materials from the game. When we brought that in, it generated a shader tree here. That's a two standard materials piped into a blend material that's then piped into what's called a direct X shader. The direct X shader is using the world vertex transition effects file that's a DirectX file for 3ds Max included with Wallworm and it has all the parameters for uh, how this uh, world vertex blend should look in the viewport. It's this DirectX shader that allows you to see this blending as you blend in the viewport. If you make your own, uh, 
you may not be able to see this like this. So uh, you may need to see the docs on how to set up those direct deck shaders if you want to make one from scratch. So one of the values of having multiple vertex paint layers is that you can actually toggle them on and off. So I can uh, go back down to different layers of this and see uh, the different settings. So unfortunately there is a kind of a, a viewport bug that as soon as I disable this it, it stops showing but if I go back down to this level, then I can toggle the layers above it on or off. And sometimes you're going to see that it will kind of hide the blending. So you'll have to learn to deal with that. But you can save these on or off. And this way, if I don't want them, if I want to experiment with different views, I can keep different vertex paint modifiers on here and then just export the one layer that I choose to use in the end. So it gives you a way to save different ones. But if you don't need different views, as soon as you're done painting with vertex paint, it's always safe to convert to editable poly because that vertex paint information is baked into the vertex alpha channel of your mesh. So let's talk about those freeform tools just for a couple minutes here. And I'm actually going to remove them for a minute. Uh, if you don't see that toolbar at the top, by default, you can always click this ribbon button that says Show Ribbon, and it brings up uh, this ribbon. Uh, it's also called the Graphite Modeling Tools, and the Freeform uh, tab is what we're using here. So the Shift function lets you shift things uh, uh, from your perspective. Just click and drag. If you Control Shift and Left Mouse button, you can change uh, the strength of this object and the size. If you shift alt click it's just the strength and again control shift and left mouse is uh, showing you the circumference of that strength that full strength and you can also uh, whenever you click it you'll see that it has this little floater here uh, you do have uh, the values that you can enter in directly here we also have other options like mirror. So if you click mirror, uh, it will mirror the function on different planes. If you click this little arrow here, you're going to get different types of functions. So this is important. Uh, if you choose uh, the default brush effects depth, then that means that from your viewport perspective, an infinite, uh, it's infinite. So if I click on right here, every vertice of this object that this uh, that this is passing through, will, regardless of where it is in the viewport, as long as it's from my perspective, it's going to click and drag. So notice both sides of this are being picked. Even if, so we have this side that's really low here, even if it's behind my viewport. So I'm going to click and drag this up you're going to notice that that side clicked and dragged up because it's an infinite selection. I'm going to click undo. If that's not what you want, you can change this to a spherical depth or a spherical radius. So if you click that, then it's spherical from the, the vertices at the point where you select from. So right now, if I click here, it's only on the other side of the mountain because those are the faces uh, that I'm selecting right now. So it's not affecting so if I bring that out, it didn't affect brushes or, or faces over here. So spherical depth is kind of like from the face you hit, a sphere. And the uh, other option, depth, is an infinite. And you have other options here for uh, the different type of uh, ways that the mirror and, and, and axes work. If we go to the push pull, it's going to, you know, push and pull the vertices from the polygons that are selected when you start clicking it. And likewise, if you hit control shift and left mouse, you can in the viewport change the radius. If you shift alt and left mouse, it's the strength. And when you click that, you're going to see that there's a, uh, let me zoom in here, 
a strength value and also a visual indicator. And if I click and drag, it's going to bring them out. If I alt click, it does the reverse. So instead of going up, it's going to go down. And also notice that like the other one, we have this little arrow here. And this gives you options. So for example, right now we're doing this to go from the original, uh, the original normal. So it's going out from the normal of the faces that were selected. If I click this, I have different options here. So if I just want to go up and down in the world, it's transform Z. So these vertices now will only go up and not in any other one. If I change it to deformed, then it will continue to go out based off of the deformation. And once we have this uh, in a very a blocky way like this say that the geometry was all mangled up we weren't paying attention it was really bad and we need to relax this area we can click the relax brush and bring this all back in we'll bring the value strength of this down so it's if I hit F4 to bring up the uh, edge view we can see the topology a little bit easier more easily so the relax brush is kind of like the subdivide. So we can subdivide, but it's you're just painting the subdivision. The relax one only has size and strength. It does not have extra options in that little floater. We also have flatten. So this allows us to flatten the polygons uh, based off of the current uh, selection, the radius. So all the polygons that that are meeting into it, it creates a uh, flattened surface that's an average of all of the, the polygons you hit. We go back to relax here. And maybe back in shift here again. Bring that up a little bit. So these are the freeform tools. You can add noise by painting, so uh, you just painting noise. And this one does have extra options. Also, I forgot to point this out, that a lot of these buttons, if you hover over it and let your mouse sit there for a second, it will actually give you some tips on the shortcuts that you can use with it and a little video that kind of shows you uh, what that specific function is going to do. So you can play around with those. Now here's some important things. Do not use Step Build. Do not use Extend. Do not use Optimize. Do not use topology, stripes, or strips, or branches. Just don't use those on your sculpt meshes because, again, you're going to change the number of vertices on here. And changing the number of vertices is always bad. I'm going to go to the vertex subobject selection. And notice the red vertices because it kept that vertex selection we made earlier on. If we want to keep those vertice selections for future use, you can use named selection sets. So I'm going to go up here and name it Original Relax Verts. That's what I'm going to name it. I'm going to hit Enter. And what that allows me to do is anytime I come to this uh, vertex subobject selection, I can always select those. So if I want to select different vertices right now and work with those, for example, let's just work with these vertices. And we might move these down just a little bit. And use soft selection. Move it out. Move these down. If I want to get the original vertices, all I have to do is select it from this list, but I'm going to actually keep this one also. So I'm going to name this uh, Trench Verts. So now I can go back and forth. I'm going to choose the original Verts, and it's selecting those. I can get rid of soft selection if I want, and it's just those vertices. And I can go to the Trench Verts. So this allows you to, to remember sets of vertices to work with at different times and it's very useful.
there are things that you can do to, to delete or to destroy these vertex selection sets. Uh, modifiers, adding modifiers will do that. So you kind of want to make sure that if you're going to use these a lot, you're probably just sticking with the editable poly or you've already done stuff with the uh, modifier stack and you've done all that stuff, but now you just want to use vertex selections. And the same thing holds true with uh, polygons. You can create polygon selections. So again, this is a selection I made earlier before we collapsed everything and it's still there. If I want to uh, select all of these, and we'll call these uh, trench polys, those ones will be available anytime I'm in vertex or in polygon subobject mode. So if I want to go back, I just click it, go back to the vertex subobject mode, and you see I have access to those uh, vertex selections. It's a very useful tool in modifying different sections, especially if you're not done and you're not sure and you need to go back and forth. So now let's discuss some new functions dealing with sculpt meshes. As mentioned earlier, sculpt meshes are not actually your displacements. They're actually just an object, an editable poly object with certain data tied to them that are tied back to your original displacements. In fact, those displacements still exist in the scene. I'm going to open up the Layer Explorer. It's on my other screen here. And you're going to see here, uh, the scene is fairly small. We have the Sculpt Mesh right here selected and visible. But down below we have these uh, WW Displacements, and they're hidden. If I select all of those and click Unhide, you're going to see that they're still there and they're unchanged. They're in the original format before the sculpt mesh was made. Now this is important because the sculpt meshes, any change you make to them, must be committed before the displacements uh, get those changes. So right now, if I export the scene into source, what you see currently with the highlighted edged uh, displacements is actually what's going to export the game, not our sculpted landscape. So in order for us to get the landscape results in here, we have to commit the sculpt mesh. So I can do that in a few ways. And one of the ways is if I want to commit every sculpt mesh in the scene, I deselect everything and then click this button over here that says commit sculpt mesh. There are other ways to get to the same function. If I click Wallworm, Level Design, there's Commit Sculpt Meshes. When you do this, if nothing is selected, then all Sculpt Meshes in the scene get committed. So when I hit, click this button, Commit Sculpt Mesh, it's going to prompt me, because I have nothing selected, that there are no objects selected and all Sculpt Meshes will be committed. This could take a while depending on your system. Now it works much faster in 3ds Max 2018.4 and later, so I highly recommend you use the latest version, and I recommend that should be 2019.3 or later. I'm going to hit yes. Now all of a sudden, all of those displacements are matching the sculpt mesh. So we'll bring out the layer explorer here again. Let's hide the sculpt mesh and just look at the displacements and you can now see that they all match the sculpt mesh. So at this point, once we export the scene, this is what we will see. So until I had committed the sculpt mesh, which then transferred the sculpt and blending data back to the original displacements, nothing would have exported, but now they will. Now this is a default feature in uh, sculpt meshes. So I'm going to unhide the sculpt mesh. If I select the sculpt mesh and then go to the modify tab, it will immediately hide the displacements that are underneath it. Because generally speaking, you should not be editing the original displacements. You should only work on the sculpt mesh. Because this is also an important thing. If I actually go and select this displacement, for example, and if I edit this displacement, 
independently of the sculpt mesh. Let's say we bring out a few of the vertices here. Move them out here like this. If I then commit my sculpt mesh, so once I selected it, hid that object, let me unhide all of these again. So we have that one. Once I commit that sculpt mesh, that, that displacement actually is going to go back to what the sculpt mesh had been sculpted to. So that's an important thing. Don't work on the displacements, work on the sculpt mesh. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the Modify tab while I have the Sculpt Mesh selected. And again, it hid all of those displacements. Now we're going to discuss a, a rollout in here called Wallworm Functions. Now again, a Sculpt Mesh is just an editable poly object. However, it has a custom attribute applied to it with all of these wallworm functions. So a lot of the things that we saw in this floater over here are actually available over here on the right. And now we're going to discuss this button, Display Walkable, here, or over here, Display Walkable. If I click this, you're going to see all of the polygons highlighted in green that you cannot walk on. So this allows you to see if the, if how you sculpted the landscape, where you can walk or not walk. We can also just uh, paint vertex blending, the alpha painting, with this button here, or four-way blends. So which of these you choose to use is dependent on which kind of material is on your object. This is a two-way blend, so we use alpha. Four-way blends will be covered later. So I'm going to turn off display walkable, so this next function will be easier to understand. We have this button here that says expand to displacements and expanded displacements polys. And I'm going to show you what those mean. If we go to any polygon sub-object or any sub-object level and select a sub-object like this vertex, if I click this expanded displacements, it's going to, in that current sub-object level, select all of the sub select all of the sub-objects of the sculpt mesh that belong to that displacement. In this case, I think I selected one that was a vertex that was belonging along the edge of two displacements. So that's why it has selected all of those. If instead I just select this one, you're going to see these are the uh, vertices that belong to the same displacement. So vertices are kind of hard to tell. Uh, but I'm going to actually do this. I'm going to select one vertex here and hit this other button. This is similar, except for it switches it automatic, automatically to polygon subobject mode. So notice right now we're in vertex subobject mode. If I hit expand to displacements polys, it selects all of the polygons that belong to that same object. So this lets you see, okay, that represents a single displacement right there. And there's the border of this displacement. So if I select, if I control click another polygon and hit expand to displacements, we're going to see all of the polygons that are part of that. If I click this and expand to displacements, it's going to expand them all. If I select like these and this one, expand to displacements. So this is helpful for different things and we'll discuss we'll use this in different scenarios as we go forward. Here is a function down here that says select small faces. So this is a curious function. I'm going to hit this right now and it didn't find any faces below this. The reason you want to use this is because you can run into problems if you ever have extremely small face sizes. So generally, you want to avoid very tiny face sizes. And we're going to create this problem by taking a vertex, turning on vertex snap mode, and I'm going to move this vertex into that. So what we're going to essentially do is make two of these faces, two triangles of this, have zero surface area. So now I'm going to select small faces. And now those faces are currently selected. If I go up to the selection here, it's going to say two polygons are selected. Now, 
they're very hard to see because they're they're collapsed essentially but if I'm out here and I don't know where they're at you can see that the gizmo takes us there so the gi selection gizmo the transformation gizmo is at the center of those uh, selected faces also if I hit Z on the keyboard it will take me to that section immediately in the viewport and this will allow me to go through and uh, fix this the reason is if we try to commit this we're gonna have problems and if we ever collapse this and remove the sculpt mesh or export it into the engine and then for whatever reason try to re-import it we're not gonna be able to make sculpt meshes out of it so what you'll need to do is is learn how to fix that so I'm actually going to right click and hit convert to vertex so it selected all of the vertices that belong to those I'm going to deselect uh, those vertices down there and I'm just going to deselect one vertice so now only vertex 25 is selected I'm going to turn off snapping and move this one up a little bit and now I have access to this other one also instead of doing that I could have used the relax tool so relax is a way to fix this so I'm going to bring this resolution down and just click there so there now that fixes that so if we go back over here and hit select small faces it didn't find any so right now it uses a size of eight uh, that would be eight units squared uh, you can use a larger one if you want to to find uh, different levels of them now notice here I'm looking at this and I see a rat's nest we have a sculpt mesh going into itself because of uh, some of our push pulls earlier probably once we have the relax tool here fix that because you don't want to have rat's nest in your uh, displacement so let's go down to this next group of controls this allows you to assign make changes to the materials or attributes of the displacements underneath now these functions happen in real time and do not need to be committed what happens is when you make a change here it's immediately updated on the underlying displacement so it works on the current sub-object selection so in this case if I wanted to remove dirt certain type if I wanted to remove collisions from the upper displacements up here what I would do is this first I go to polygon sub-object mode and select sections and then to make sure that it's the displacements I want I'll hit this expand to displacements and it will affect all of these displacements that are represented by the currently highlighted polygons if this is what I want to apply this these settings to I then just go down here and make changes so I can choose to send the light map scale the physics attributes etc so if I don't want any type of collision I'm gonna click all three of these and hit assign all flags to selected that means all of those displacements will immediately get no fizz, no hall, and no ray. If I want to change just one, so either on or off, I hit the little arrow button to the right of it, and it will assign to the current sub-object selection whatever the current value is, whether it's checked or not checked, onto that selection. This button just happens to do all three of these. If I want to change the light map scale of these, at once I just type in a value here and hit set and it will assign the light map scale to those displacements now the material one is is kind of important here so if we want to change what material is at different sections in this object we need to assign it with this menu now here's the thing this list here will only show you what materials are currently already assigned to this uh, sculpt mesh so we're going to discuss assigning more new brand new materials to this object so let's bring out our material browser again which I have in my other viewport still let's say we have we don't have the second material as a world vertex transition already so let's say we have to make a brand new one so I'm going to take the current rocks and grass 06 that we have here and I'm going to hit plus blend so it's going to take the two materials that I already have and it's going to show them here and I'm going to delete 
the rock right here. Okay. So now we need to go find the, the material that we want to add into this. So let's say we wanted to have, I want to use uh, a, this rock floor 03. So I'm going to hit this plus blend. So it's going to add it to the second slot here. And I actually want to swap these back because I want the grass in the same slot that I had earlier. Now I'm going to click this button that says send to slate. What's going to happen here is slate created a brand new material from here. It created a blend and then it created a direct deck shader. So this is a new material that doesn't exist in the game yet and we're gonna we're just taking those two and making a new one that we will then send to the game. So what I'm gonna do is select my current material so bring it into and there's the the current existing one and here's our new one and it gave a default name based off of the original two and gave a path that's going to export that too if you want to export it to a different one we'll have to change the name but I'm going to keep this one for now and here's what we have to do we have to create what's called a multi sub object material if one doesn't already exist on our sculpt mesh so it's under general and it's called multi sub object I'm going to set the number to 2 because that's all the materials I'm going to be using on here and set 1 to the first one and 2 to the second one. And I'm going to get out of the sub-object selection and now assign this multi-material to our objects here. And now I'm going to click this little up arrow because this will refresh this list here. And we're going to see that there are now two materials listed here, the original and the second one. So if I want this bottom row to have that second material, I just go there and I could, before I do this, hit expand and displacements just to make sure, all right, that fits it. And now I can go down here and change it to the second and hit assign material. What happened there is it assigned that material. Now we don't see any visual change here because uh, the first material is still, it was already using that material. So now what we can do is we can click this paint alpha and I might change this here in the bottom. Right-click, convert to edible poly. So again, if you want to add materials, you have to use a multi-sub-object material on your displacement or on your sculpt mesh. If there was not one already there, you create one. If there is one there, all you do to add new materials that are available is to add them to this multi-sub-object material. So in this case, I'd click add or set the number here to add new ones. And when you do that, you'll be able to find them on this list and assign them to sections of your sculpt mesh. So this is important that the any function that's in this assign group happens immediately. Other functions like the, vert, the vertex painting and stuff and moving vertices around, those are only updated on the displacements when you commit the sculpt mesh. This block down here under commit will uh, give you options for the committing. There are different options here. We'll, we'll explain this. This commit status, so when you have that on, it will slightly slow down and you'll see a little message down here for each displacement that gets committed just to see um, it's not really necessary. In fact, it slightly speeds up the commit if you keep that off. When you use collapse displacements, that means that the underlying displacements are always converted to an editable poly after the commit. This will mean that if you happen to have modifiers on them, those modifiers will get lost. The commit UVs is off by default, and this is a very important uh, topic we'll cover here in a minute. You should only turn this on if you understand that topic. The commit multi-blends. 
This option will determine whether or not the four-way blend channel is committed and saved in the VMF for this object. So this current scene, we're using two-way blend materials. We really don't even need this. That does increase the file size if you have that on. So I don't need that in this case. In the commit multi-blend colors, is uh, also should be off in almost all cases unless you happen to use a version of source that is using multi-blend colors in your displacements. Uh, I believe that would only be uh, one of the versions of Dota. If you hit commit all, it will commit every sculpt or every displacement in your entire sculpt mesh. If you commit selected only, it will work much faster. So how that works is if I select just these polygons to see which displacements will be updated. I can click, I don't have to, but I can click to get this expand to displacements button. So this shows me which ones will be committed. So in this case, if I hit commit selected changes, it will only commit these two displacements. So this is helpful if you've only made a few vertex changes on this little section here and you don't need to commit the entire sculpt mesh. This is mostly important if you have a scene that has hundreds or thousands of uh, displacements in your sculpt mesh, then it can be you know, time consuming depending on your computer speed and which version of Max you're using. Right down below here, it actually shows you how long the last full commit took. So anytime you hit this commit all changes, it shows you the amount of time it takes. So this sculpt mesh actually commits very fast and there's really no reason not to you commit always. If you hit revert to pieces, what happens is it will bring up this prompt here. It will say, do you want to commit changes first? If not, any change made since the last commit will be lost. So basically when you do this, it will delete the sculpt mesh. If you click yes, it will commit it first then delete it. If you click no, it will just delete it and then show all of the displacements that belong to it at their state at the last time this sculpt mesh was committed. So again, if you hit no, any change since the last commit will be lost. And if you hit cancel, nothing will happen. This modify section allows you to add displacements from the scene onto your sculpt mesh. So it will prompt you to pick other displacements and then combine them in here. If you click Remove Selected, it actually removes those displacements from the current sculpt mesh. So let me, let me commit all first here, just to make sure. I'm going to go to Polygon Subobject Mode, and we're just selecting these. And I'm going to hit Remove Selected. When I do this, I've already committed, so I don't need to commit that. Those two objects are now back to just displacements and the sculpt mesh is, so they're no longer part of it. If I need to add those back, I can hit add displacement, select one, and add it back into it. Let me go ahead and remove those. Uh, I'm gonna remove those two, but I'm gonna click this, this says remove to new sculpt. If I do that, those two become a, a separate sculpt mesh. So now there are two separate sculpt meshes. Now in this case, if I am selected this one, anything I do here will only relate to this sculpt mesh and it will not affect the other one. In fact, if I have this one selected and I do some push-pull on it, You'll notice that it's no longer lined up with that one. We're going to go ahead and commit this sculpt mesh. Commit all. Now what if I wanted to bring these two back together or sew them? Sculpt meshes will not sew together um, necessarily. So I'd have to combine them to sew them and we'll show you how to do that. So if I want to combine these back into one sculpt mesh, I select them both, and over here in our displacement settings footer again, 
which again, which we found under the level design launch displacement floater option here. I can click this button over here that says merge selected sculpt meshes. Now, which one you have selected first becomes the one that's kept and the other ones are merged into it. So I'm going to select the large one first and then hit control click to select this other one and click merge selected sculpt meshes. Now, once we're here, we can go in and sew these. I'm going to select these like this. Then expand to displacements, just so we can see here. Actually, an easier way to select these would have been select the border and then expand polys. So there we see that there are four displacements that are part of this. If we want to sew these, we go down here and hit Sew Selected. I do not want to commit this because it's already been committed. Click No. It has to actually detach them, sew them, and reattach them, but it did that. This next group of functions I'm not going to cover in this video. And uh, these other ones here in miscellaneous, I'm only going to cover one. So that is the quadrify me. The triangulate me function does not work. Uh, it's just there for the intent of adding it in the future. Quadrify me. So this function it is a little bit dangerous, so let me explain why. You should only use this if your materials are using seamless scale. You should only use this function if you're using seamless scale. Or if you are not committing the UVs, uh, changes from the UVs. Because the quadrify function cannot keep UV changes. So if you change any of the UVs in this object, those UVs cannot be saved after you've been quadrified. So whatever UVs we currently have, if you quadrify me, they're stuck on that until this sculpt mesh is completely destroyed. Now the value of the quadrify me function, notice that the mesh is triangulated. However, there are many functions in Max that are optimized for a quadrified mesh. If you click quadrify me, here's what happens. You can now uh, see that this mesh is quadrified and we can use all the, the shortcuts that you would normally use with a quadrified mesh. So if I go to edge mode, if I double click this edge, I can select the entire uh, loop here. Same with polygons. If I control click, I can select that. And I can add with loops a lot more efficiently than if this was not quadrified. There's also one other caveat with quadrify me. If your mesh is quadrified, the display walkable function may not be 100% accurate. In fact, there's a good chance it's not because it works at the polygon level. And the actual display walkable for complete accuracy is on the tri level. So it's only mildly accurate. So this display walkable is working on the polygon normal instead of the triangle normals. So that's something to be aware of. And if you really need the, the display walkable function, our only solution here is we can commit all, revert to pieces, and then create a sculpt mesh from these displacements again. So now we're back to an actual uh, a sculpt mesh that actually demonstrates the, the display walkable by triangle. So the quadrify me is a one-way streak. If you change it to quadrify, the only way to get back to the triangulate function is to commit your sculpt mesh and then revert it to pieces, then uh, recreate the sculpt mesh until uh, this function works, which it currently does not. If you click it, it'll just tell you that it, it's not available. Quick fact, quick warning, is that you should never, ever use the Quadrify function inside of the, the modeling toolbar. If you do that, you will invalidate your sculpt mesh. So if you want to Quadrify it, you need to use the Quadrify me function in the sculpt meshes modify tab. So that's a few, uh, that's the majority of the functions in the modify tab of a sculpt mesh that we're going to cover. 
Uh, there are a few more that we didn't cover, but you can look in the docs and or uh, wait for uh, updated information in the future. I'm going to turn off Display Walkable and we're going to discuss some other uh, features and functions about displacements inside Max. So the first one uh, we're going to discuss right now is when, when working with displacements, you a lot of times see these UVs that are stretching as you sculpt them. And, you know, there are different ways of dealing with this. So on one hand, you may be tempted to change the UV scales of uh, your displacements. So we're going to discuss how to address this, and we're going to discuss UVs in general. I'm going to actually remove this for now and get rid of our ribbon here. We don't need this for now. Here's a couple things. Now this is related to how displacements are stored technically in, in the source engine format. There are very few things we can do to these displacements that are valid, okay? Because every displacement, the UVs for it, are defined by a plane of the original brush side from which it was displaced. If you want to modify the UVs on a sculpt mesh, the safest way to do it is to use what's called the UVW X4 modifier right here. This should be the only modifier you ever use to change the UVs of your sculpt meshes. You should never use any other modifier. When we do this, we can do things like changing the tiling, uh, change it to like two on the U and two on the V. We can change the offsets to slide them around. Of course, this is global. So if you want it to be on specific, uh, specific ones, we can add polygon selections and choose the you know underlying displacements. And it has a rotation, which will rotate the UVs. I'm going to go back to where we were initially. Those are the only versions you should ever use. So let me just discuss one thing that you may be tempted to do and why you should not do it. So I'm going to go delete that modifier and I'm going to add a uh, unwrap UVW modifier and we'll open the UV editor. So you'll see that every one of these UVs is still projected in the original polygon uh, from which it was located. In fact, I can if I want to. I can't use this unwrap modifier, but I have to be very careful that all I ever do is either move, scale, or rotate. And it has to be at the element level, which would be each and every single one of these. Right? So you should never, ever modify these at a level that's different. So you should never uh, relax. For example, if I select this and I go to the relax menu and do this to relax it to the actual shape, it may look like what you expect it should look like. Hit F2 to toggle that. And I got rid of stretching. In fact, if I go up here and we'll select that whole thing here and we'll relax it. We'll go to this one and move it let's lay these all out and we'll select this one let's scale these up so that they uh, so this makes sense here so if we select this one and hit relax It may look better in the viewport. Here's the thing. These UVs will not be what's exported into the game engine. If you ever relax it or move around vertices like this, whatever vertices you move will not work. The only thing you can do is at the entire element level, move, rotate, and scale. Anything different like this relax 
will not work. It works for models and other types of geometry. It does not work for brushes or displacements. So do not do that. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this modifier and go back to where we were before that happened. So what if we want to get rid of this stretching? We'll discuss that now. So how do we solve this? If you're using a material that just appears stretchy like this, you may have to either update the material or create a new one. So I'm actually going to open up the material editor, which I already have open in my other viewport here. And I'm going to double click the direct X shader that's used for this object. I'm going to scroll down here to a section that says be seamless. It has a value here for seamless scale. This will turn on a function of the material called seamless scale. When you turn this on, the UVs of the object are just not even used. I'm going to click this and uh, you can see that the strip down the middle I must have assigned a, a different material there. That's okay. We'll fix that. And I'll go to this other material and turn it on as well. Be seamless. So notice now that there is no stretching no matter what. Well, you'll see a, a little bit of stretching on any on corners where one of the polygons on the corner is facing directly north and south, directly east and west, or directly up and down. So if they're hard edges like that, you can see some. So in this case, um, there's a little bit of stretching here. So to get rid of that, we'll open up our ribbon again, go to the relax tool, and relax this a little bit. So if we have multiple materials like this, um, let's go ahead make sure let's assign uh, make sure these are all using the same material so now you can see that the blending has very little stretching anywhere so seamless scale is something so there's a little bit of stretching and you can see it's because we have a hard edge approaching 90 degrees and one or more of the faces are facing in straight uh, uh, one of the cardinal directions. So I'm going to go back to the relax and see now that's gone. So you may have a few cases here and there that you can't actually completely solve with relax. And in those cases, you may end up having to uh, to go in and hide it with a prop or, or edit it, you know, do whatever you need to do. But seamless scale is one of the best options. Now, here's the thing. This is at the material level. So with the material that I created, this one right here, that's perfectly fine because this material doesn't exist yet in the game until I export it. This other material right here, already did exist in the game. So because this is an existing one that already has a, a set parameter and used in other levels, I'm going to have to actually change this material. So I'm going to, I'm actually going to double click this material and change its path or copy the path that it used. And I'm going to double click this one and paste the same path and I'm going to copy that name that I have to this and paste the name in here so I gave the blend material the same name what this means is well, I have to export these two materials before they'll be available inside of source so to get these materials from this into the game these new materials I need to make sure I have the sculpt mesh selected which I do and I click wallworm exporters export brush textures now again this isn't just a brush here this is displacement but this is the option you're going to choose we'll click that it's going to bring open this uh, menu here it's going to list uh, any of the materials and textures among the current object selection now here's the thing some of these are unselectable and some of them are unchecked those that are unchecked 
are are unchecked because those things already exist. I don't need to re-export these base textures because they're already part of my game. All I need to export is the new material, which is this blend material, and the tool texture, which it creates. So both of these. So I just hit export selected. And now we'll have our textures in the game. So at this point, we're going to go ahead and send this uh, landscape uh, to, to Hammer, just so you can see it. And you don't need to use Hammer for any of your level design for Source anymore, but we're just going to do this just so you can see. Before we export, just as a precaution, we'll want to commit the Sculpt Mesh. So we're going to go ahead and choose Commit Sculpt Meshes. This will make sure that any of the changes here are definitely committed. Now we'll export this as a game level. So as long as I have this option here that says displacements, my VMF will include all of my displacements. So I'm going to go ahead and just export this. I'm going to send it to my desktop and uh, save it as this VMF file that we, and I'm going to open up Hammer here again. Let's open up our scene here in Hammer. And here we go. You can see that we have our displacements in here. Thank you. 